Well, good evening, everyone. And tonight, we are continuing our series on a contrast in characters. Now, if you can remember from last week, we looked at Lot. And this evening, we're going to be looking at Abraham. The character of these two men, they stood in contrast to one another. Lot walked by sight, whereas Abraham walked by faith. And last week, as we went through our message on Lot, the man who walked by sight, we, we thought about the choices that he made, you know, how he lived with the consequences of that choice, you know, when he chose to live by sight. We saw that living by sight leads to tragic, tragic consequences. And Lot experienced those tragedies, you know, because he lived by sight, Lot was careless. Um, he was made a captive, he compromised, and he experienced catastrophe in losing everything he sought after in life, both peoples and possessions. And so the lesson that we learned from last week's sermon simply wasn't, don't be like Lot. The lesson we learned was that our heart's desire will control and dictate the way we live. And so that's the reason why Lot lived by sight, because his affections were set on the things below. Now this evening, as we continue um, our series on the contrast with characters by looking at Abraham, hopefully we'll see that it's something similar. The lesson isn't simply be like Abraham. I want us to see that Abraham's heart was controlled by his desire, which affected the way he lived. You know, just like Lot, Abraham's life was controlled by his heart's desires. Now, the difference between these two men is what they desired in their hearts. See, Lot desired the world, and so he lived by sight. Abraham, he desired God, and so he lived by faith. And so the point of the sermons on Abraham and Lot is to help us see that the desires of our hearts will determine and dictate whether we live by faith or live by sight. And so the challenge, the exhortation, the overall message for us is this, let Christ be the one who rules upon the throne of your hearts. With that in mind, let's turn to our passage this evening. And in your Bibles, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll be reading from verses 8 to 19. Hebrews 11, 8 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Ending there, we trust that God will bless the reading of his word this evening. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening, and we ask that you would please help us as we consider your word. It's easy for us to be discouraged. It's easy for us to be distracted, especially as we are sat in our own homes. But we ask, Father, that you would help us this evening to come and worship you in the hearing and in the um, preaching of your word. Help us this evening to be challenged, to be changed, to be um, conformed to the image of our Savior and to desire him more as a result of what we go through this evening. Father, we ask that you would please have your hand of blessing upon us. May you have um, mercy and show us grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Many times in this passage, we are told that Abraham lived by faith. It says, by faith, 
Abraham. But what is faith? You know, I think it's important for us to understand what faith is, you know, seeing as though we're on the subject of living by faith. Now, sadly, there's a lot of wrong thoughts, misconceptions, and wrong ideas about what faith is. You know, according to the world, faith is this grand mystical thing that you just feel. It's this, you know, weird tingly feeling that you get by being all super spiritual or religious. It's, it's this surreal experience, people think. But that's not actually what faith is. It's not this fluffy feeling that you get from being religious. You see, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 tells us what faith is. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And a different translation says, faith is being sure of what we hope for, being certain of what we do not see. In other words, faith is simply trust or confidence. So when we say we have faith, what we're saying is we have confidence in something or someone, or that we trust in something or someone. So when we say we have faith in something, we trust in that something or someone. And so when we say that Abraham lived by faith, what we're simply saying is that Abraham lived with confidence. He lived with trust, and specifically confidence in God, trusting in God. He trusted who God is, and he trusted in the promises that God had given him. That's what it means to live by faith. Now, with, with that in mind, let's look at how faith, how confidence in God affected Abraham's lifestyle. You see, last week we looked at how living by sight had consequences for Lot. This night we're going to look at Abraham and how living by faith had consequences for him as well. So tonight what we're going to be looking at are five things. Because he lived by faith, Abraham was, one, submitted to the call of God. Two, he was a stranger by the will of God. Three, he was a standard for the people of God. Four, sincere in his devotion to God. And five, secure in the power of God. So let's look at the first point. Um, the first point is because he lived by faith, Abraham was submitted to the call of God. That's in verse 8. Let's read verse 8 together. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. Abraham submitted himself to God's call. He didn't doubt, he didn't question God, but he accepted that God had commanded him to do something. But he went beyond just accepting that God had commanded him. He, he didn't just accept, but he also did something about it. He obeyed. Abraham went out and did as God had said. You know, God called him all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, where it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee, or I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed." God said to Abraham, get out of your country, separate yourself from your people. And how did he respond? He obeyed. Now imagine yourselves in Abraham's position. Let's put ourselves in his position right now. Imagine that God had told you to pack up and go, leave everything behind, everything you've ever known, your whole life, your people, your culture, pack up and leave. How would you respond? You see, Abraham could have responded by saying no but he didn't say no. He could have responded by questioning God, you know, asking God, why do you want me to do this? But we don't have any mention of him questioning. Instead, he submits to the call of God and he obeys. Now, there's two things that I want us to see about Abraham's response. Two amazing things that I want to point out. First, his response to God's call was immediate. In verse 8 again of Hebrews 11, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And also in Genesis 12, verse 4, it says, So Abraham, or Abram, departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. It was an immediate call met with an immediate response. God told him to go, and he did. That's an amazing thing, to respond in an immediate manner. The second thing was that his response was impressive. It wasn't just immediate, it was impressive. He went out not knowing whither 
he went. It was impressive because Abraham went not knowing where he was going. When God called Abraham, God didn't tell him where he would end up. He just said, go and I will lead you as you go. God didn't give him a, a plan or an outline or a map pointing out where he, he was going to go. He, you know, God didn't say, hey, Abraham, here's a map of Ur of the Chaldees and of the Canaan. I want you to go here, day one, day two, day three, day four, so on. There was none of that. He just said, go. And Abraham responded. God says, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, which implied that God would lead as Abraham walked in obedience. And Abraham did walk in obedience, trusting that God would lead with every step of the way. God called Abraham and Abraham responded to the call, not by questioning, but by obeying. He responded immediately and impressively. But why would he do that? Why would Abraham obey? You know, it seems really ridiculous to just, it, you know, go. It's almost as if he just blindly went. Well, it tells us by faith. He went because he was confident in God. He trusted God. Why was he confident? Why did he trust God? Well, he was confident and he trusted God because his heart was ruled by God. God was the king who sat upon the throne of his heart. You see, that's a difference with Abraham and Lot that we see this evening. They were different when it came to decision making. Abraham made his decision based upon God's call, based upon God's leading. Whereas Lot in Genesis 13 made his decision carelessly, not considering God at all. Lot didn't allow God to lead him. Rather, he let his own will, his own intuition lead him. He lived by sight. Abraham lived by faith, allowing God to lead him. Secondly, we see that because Abraham was a man of faith, he was a stranger by the will of God. He was a stranger by the will of God. Back to Hebrews 11, please. Hebrews 11. And let's read verses 9 and 10. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with them of the same promise, for he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham lived his life as a stranger and as a pilgrim in the land. The passage here tells us that he lived in tabernacles or he lived in tents. After God brought him to the promised land, you think that he, you know, You'd have thought that he'd settle down somewhere, that he would occupy a village or a town, maybe a little house in the city, and he would start there and make a name for himself, right? You thought that that's what would have happened, but that's not at all what happened. Yes, there were towns, there were cities in the land. Abraham could have gone into any of those places, but instead he chose to live in the tents. He made himself dwell in tabernacles. He lived as a pilgrim. He separated himself from the world. Why? Why did he remain a stranger to the people? Why? Well, he made sure that he didn't make himself one with the people. That doesn't mean that Abraham hated the people. He just refused to identify with them. He refused to identify with the people of the land. You know, yes, he interacted with the people. We see that in Genesis 14. But he didn't identify with them. He knew that though he was among them, he wasn't one of them. He never identified himself with the world around him. He remained a stranger. And that's a massive difference compared to Lot. You know, Lot's approach to the world was very different to Abraham, right? We read last week that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom with the intention of getting closer and closer and eventually moving in to the city. He eventually moved and settled into the city to the point where he became a prominent figure in Sodom, a man who sat in the gates of Sodom. But Abraham, he remained a, stra he remained a stranger. He was confident that what God had in store for him was far better than anything the world could ever Offer, whereas Lot saw the world and he wanted it and he desired it. Now, again, please don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. You know, I'm not saying that we should, when we live by faith, cast away the world and 
make ourselves monks or hermits. That's not at all what I'm trying to say. We shouldn't close ourselves off from the world, but rather, living by faith means that we should trust God more than we trust the world, that we would rather associate and identify ourselves with God rather than associate and identify ourselves with the world. It's not about cutting ourselves off from society and living in seclusion. It's about trusting God, identifying with God, and being lights in a crooked and perverse generation. That's what Paul says in Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights. See, when you live by faith, you will remain a stranger here on earth because you know that this is your temporary home, because heaven is our home and our sights will be set on heavenly things, not on earthly things. Third point, because Abraham lived by faith, he was a standard for the people of God. He was a standard for the people of God. Let's read verses 11 and 12. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude as, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Now when we read verse 11, we notice that it's not really about Abraham, but it's about Sarah and how through faith she received strength to conceive. However, when we take a look at Sarah's life over in the book of Genesis, we can hardly say that she was a woman of faith, can we? You know, we can hardly say that she was someone who was confident in God. We can hardly say that she trusted God. After all, it was Sarah's idea to have Abraham um, have a child through Hagar in Genesis 16. And in Genesis 18, when God told Abraham that Sarah would have a child, what did Sarah do? Let's... Let's read a little bit of it. It says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old, uh, my Lord being old also. She laughed, not in joy, but in unbelief. She didn't think she would have a son. And yet right here in Hebrews 11, it says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So the question we have to ask is, how did Sarah go from laughing in unbelief to judging him, God, as faithful who had promised? From unbelief to belief, from doubting to confidence, how do we go from there with Sarah? Well, I propose that Abraham's faith had eventually rubbed off on her that by the end of her life, she was no longer this doubting or scheming woman, but she was a woman who trusted and who was confident in God because she saw the example of her husband, Abraham. Abraham was an example, a standard of what it means to live by faith. And he was an example to those who were close to him, to his family, to his servants, and those he interacted with. He was an example of faith. Now let's think about Lot and the example that he set for his family. Remember last week when we talked about Lot and about how he compromised, he tried to offer his virgin daughters to the mob who were outside his house. And remember how he tried to persuade his sons-in-law to leave the city with him, but then they just mocked him and refused to listen. They just brushed him aside. And remember how at the end of Genesis 19, he ended up in this really wicked and incestuous relationship with his daughters. See, there's a difference between the examples these two men set. Abraham was a standard of faith and of faithfulness, whereas Lot was a standard of carnality, of worldliness. There's the difference between these two men. When you live a life by faith, you become a standard an example to other people, which can cause them to follow you as they follow Christ. It's exactly what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 11. Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. So when we live by faith, when we walk as godly people, we will be an example to those around us, pointing them to Christ. And that's what Abraham did. He lived in such a way that pointed to God, so much so that his wife saw that and followed in his footsteps, herself trusting in the Lord. Fourth point, because he lived by faith, because he walked by faith, 
Abraham was sincere in his devotion to God, verses 13 through to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. You see, Abraham died not having seen the promises fulfilled. He died not having seen the promises come to pass, the promises that God had given him. Now, we have to ask a question. Does this mean that God failed him? Does this mean that God has failed in delivering, living up to his word? No, not at all. It meant that Abraham understood who God is and what God was like. Abraham understood that God is eternal, that God is faithful, that God is true, that he can be trusted. His words are secure. And so because of that, Abraham trusted God so much so that he believed that the promises would be fulfilled even if he didn't live to see that day when, those, um, when the fulfillment of the promises come. He died not having received the promises. However, he saw them from afar off. Abraham knew that they would be fulfilled. He knew that they would be fulfilled and so he remained a pilgrim on earth. He lived looking upwards and being mindful of heavenly things because he trusted God, because his heart was ruled by God. Now, does this not speak of sincere devotion? Of course it does. Abraham was sincerely devoted to God, so much so he would dedicate his whole life to living as a pilgrim, as a stranger, despite the fact he wouldn't see the promises fulfilled. You know, it, it almost seems like it's blind faith, but in reality, it's not. It's confidence. It's trust, trusting in who God is, trusting in what he has said, and trusting confidently that he would do as he had promised. And this is how Abraham lived his life. And it was a life lived on display for the people around him to see. He lived in such a way that spoke of confidence to God. Think about it. If you were living in Canaan land back in whenever that was, and you saw Abraham and his family living as tent dwellers. You think to yourself, this man has been with us for years, for decades. Why has he not moved in? So the people around him would have known the reason why. Abraham would have stood out. He lived in such a way that spoke of his confidence in God. It was his life, not just his words, but his life was on display. His life was a confession of faith. His actions were a statement of faith. He lived in the light of God's promises. Abraham was so focused on God and so focused on the things of God that he didn't even look back to his old life. You know, he decided to follow and he didn't turn back. Now, could he have turned back? Could he have gone back to his homeland? Of course he could. Let's read verse 15 again. And Truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. If he wanted to, if he wanted to, Abraham could have packed up and he could have gone back to his homeland, but he didn't. If he wanted to, he could have packed up and he could have left the tents. He could have gone into the towns, gone into the cities, found a home somewhere and built up riches and an empire for himself, but he didn't. Why? because Abraham was sincerely devoted to God, because he lived by faith, because God was the king who sat upon the throne of his heart. Abraham knew that what God had promised him was far, far better than anything this world could ever offer a thousand times over. We see that Abraham truly lived by faith and not by sight. You see, Abraham could see the cities and the towns around him, but he couldn't see the heavenly city that he was promised. And yet the Bible tells us that he saw them from afar off. He chose to live not by sight, but by faith. He could look back to his homeland, and if he wanted to, he could have gone back, but instead he looked forward, desiring that better country. 
That's how Abraham lived his life, whereas Lot lived for what was here and now. You know, Abraham lived for what was to come. Lot was devoted to, accum to accumulating riches, to wealth, only to lose it all. But Abraham was devoted to God, knowing that there is an eternity with him to look forward to, never to be lost, ever. You see, when you live by faith, when you walk confidently, trusting in God, you will live with sincerity. You will be wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. Even when things get tough, even when you don't see the fulfillment of God's promises this side of glory, because ultimately you will know that God's promises will be fulfilled. And finally this evening, point number five. Because Abraham walked by faith, he was secure in the power of God, verses 17 through to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, in order to understand this part of Hebrews 11, we need to go back to when Abraham offered up his son as a sacrifice. That's back in Genesis 22. Now, we'll not read the whole of Genesis 22. That's a different um, a sermon for a different um, time. But I'm sure many of us are, f are familiar with the story. So what we'll do is we'll just read the first three verses. So over in Genesis 22, verses one to three. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. God had told him to sacrifice his son. Now, can you imagine how heartbreaking that situation must have been for Abraham? You see, this is his son, his beloved son, the, the son he's been waiting for for many years of his life. And here he is, Isaac, his beloved Isaac. Abraham has, had watched this boy grow up to become a man. That's his son, his beloved son, who has his whole life ahead of him. And yet God says, I want you to take your son, your only son, who you love, Isaac, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. That's a heartbreaking situation to be in, but instead of withholding anything from God, Abraham obeyed. Why would Abraham obey such a command from God? I thought he was a loving father. Why would he do this to his son? Yes, he was a loving father, but he was also a man who was confident in God. And so he knew that whatever happens, he would be secure in the power of God. Why would Abraham obey such a command? Well, it's because he knew that God is the one in charge and Abraham trusted God. That's why it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Hebrews eleven nineteen gives us more information, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. You see, one of the, the reason why Abraham went through with it, why he obeyed, was because he knew that God was powerful. Abraham believed that if he sacrificed Isaac, God would raise him up from the dead. He was that confident in God. He was that confident in God, so much so that he knew he was secure in God's power. You see, God promised in Genesis 17 that it would be through Isaac, through Isaac, that Abraham would have descendants. Now, how could that happen if Isaac was dead? It can't happen. But because God trusted that God would, or be, be, uh, let me try that again, because Abraham trusted that God would fulfill his promise, he believed that if Isaac died, 
God would raise him up again. You know, think about it. Has Abraham ever seen anyone raised from the dead? No. You know, in fact, I don't think we have any record of any resurrection before Elijah. And that's way, way after Abraham's time. But right here, Abraham believed that God could resurrect people. Abraham trusted God. You see, when you live by faith, you can live with assurance. You can live with assurance knowing that God will do as he has promised, even when it seems impossible. You know, if God said it, then it's going to happen. And we can be sure of that. We can be secure in that, secure in the power of God's promises. Now, I know we've gone through a lot tonight. And as we've looked at Abraham, I really hope that this has stirred up in your hearts a passion to live by faith. Now, last week, we saw that living by sight had consequences, bad consequences. Well, this evening, we see that living, walking by faith has consequences as well, but good consequences. And, you know, when you, when you compare the two ways of living, living by sight or living by faith, which would you rather live by? Which would you rather live by? You know, of the two options there, only one of them is enjoyable and pleasing to God at the same time. So anyway, as we conclude this evening and everything that we've gone through, I'm sure we want to ask ourselves, do I want to live by sight or do I want to live by faith? And that is a good question. However, there's something else. I want you to ask, what's the desire of my heart? Who or what rules and captivates my heart? Now, you may be wondering what, has, what the desires of your heart has to do with living by faith or sight. Well, as I've said countless times throughout this evening, your heart's desire will determine the way that you live, which means if your heart is ruled by Christ, then your life will show it because you will as a result of having Christ rule and reign upon the throne of your heart, you will live by faith. However, if your heart is ruled by, ruled by someone else or by something else, even if it's yourself, then you will live by sight. And yes, it's possible to live by sight even as a Christian, even as a believer. You know, Remember from last week, Lot is called righteous Lot or just Lot, and yet he still lived by sight. Now again, this message is more than just be like Abraham, or try to live by faith and not by sight. It's more than that. Certainly, we want to follow in Abraham's footsteps. Certainly, we want to live by faith and be an example to others around us. But moreover, this message, the, the whole point of this message this evening is this. Let your hearts desire Christ. Let your hearts be ruled and be captivated by Christ so that we will, as a result, live by faith faith, wholly trusting him. Again, I want to turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, like what we did last week. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Yes, We've looked at Abraham and Lot and seen the contrast in their characters. And yes, we want to avoid living like Lot and we want to live like Abraham. But moreover, that is only possible when our hearts are wholly surrendered to Christ. So brothers and sisters, as you listen this evening, I urge you, I encourage you, surrender to Christ. And yes, even as a Christian, surrender to him daily, surrender to him, moment by moment, surrender to him and live trusting in him. May God bless these thoughts to our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we do want to thank you so much for your word and for the characters of Lot and Abraham, the examples of these two men. Father, we thank you for what you've taught us from your word and help us then as a result of what we've heard last week and this evening, help us to cherish our Savior. Help us to yield and surrender to our Savior. Help us to be wholly um, devoted to Christ and have him rule and reign as Lord upon the throne of our hearts. Father, please 
save us and rescue us from ourselves or from anything else that we seek to trust in. Help us live as your people. Help us live um, effective by having our hearts be ruled by Christ, by desiring him and desiring no one else but him. We commit to you ourselves this evening in Jesus' name. Amen.